Hi everybody, welcome to City Beat. I'm your host Nancy Byrne and we are coming to you from Las Vegas City Hall where photographer Steve Horlock and I are socially distancing and the only reason I took my mask off is because we have chosen an area that is temporarily closed to the public. So, admit it, if you get a parking ticket or you need to report to jury duty, do you know which of all of the official buildings to go to in our downtown? It can be very confusing. We work in City Hall and sometimes find it confusing. But all of that confusion and any frustration is about to end because a new Muni court is being built right across from City Hall. It's about 60% completed, but City Beat was given an exclusive look inside. In June of 2019, ground was broken on a new municipal court building right across from Las Vegas City Hall. It had been determined many years ago our six municipal courtrooms, along with the many programs that run parallel to those courtrooms, were getting increasingly crowded and difficult to find where they are currently located at the Regional Justice Center. We sat down with Chief Judge Cynthia Lee Young right before heading out on a tour of the new courthouse. We've had a lot of growth in the last several years and this will be a one-stop shop. Um, it's less confusing. I think the Regional Justice Center is a fine building, but there's lots of different um, offices and county entities that are located there. So if you have an issue that's going on with municipal court, you only have to go to one place. The municipal court administrator agrees this will go a long way toward even better customer service. It's difficult when, when people go to the RJC, the Regional Justice Center, because it does have the municipal court, the Las Vegas Justice Court, the 8th Judicial District Court, used to have the Supreme Court. Uh, and people would come and even though they knew municipal court was there, it was hard to find us. We were literally mixed within all the other courts on six different floors of that building. Um, here, they'll come here, it's only municipal court. It's easy to find. Our signage uh, that we're doing with the architects is gonna be very clear. Most of our foot traffic is either gonna be on the first and second floor. We were treated to the hard hat tour courtesy of Martin Harris Construction to see for ourselves how this new LEED Silver Certified building is laid out for ease and convenience for anyone needing almost anything related to Las Vegas Muni Court, Traffic Court, or the City Attorney's Criminal Division. This is 140,000 square feet. We're looking at a lot of different structural types here. It's mainly structural steel, uh, structural concrete, and then we've got these masonry towers. Frank Joyce is the project manager. Leading the tour, he started in the highly secure area where inmates and officers will enter when appearing in court. So here's the, the main sally port entry for the inmates. Uh, they'll, they'll come through the, the sally port door here and be transferred directly into the holding area. Uh, Chief Judge was talking about um, the security of the building and it's it, the, the, the whole design is set up to keep a separation between uh, the inmates and the public and the staff. You would expect security to be a top priority for a courthouse, but the architect and the builders go the extra mile when it comes to safety in every aspect of the building. Right now we're in the parking area of the, of the courthouse, so there's a number of parking uh, spaces down here for the staff and the judges to park. Uh, they have a secure elevator that will take them to their uh, their offices and to the basically to the courtrooms. Both parking areas are mainly underground, as is the area where the city's Department of Public Safety dispatch will find its new home. Next stop is upstairs to the first floor of the courthouse. This is the main entry to the court to the courthouse. Um, all the public will enter through uh, a secure door and pass through a secure checkpoint, uh, similar to what you would do at the airport. Uh, this whole space here will be open, as you can see, as, as an atrium. There'll be a lot of glass on the west wall here, so it'll be a, a very grand entry. Uh, we have a grand staircase that the, the steel of which is already installed. This will have some glass components to it. Going up that showpiece staircase, you will find one of the busiest courtrooms in the city, which is traffic court. So it is the largest courtroom in the building. Continuing through the second floor, plenty of space for class and conference rooms that support our Muni specialty courts. One of the biggest things happens on this floor, and that's our support for our special programs. So we have counseling services, our specialty court services are here. We have five classrooms for various classes that we run, whether that be DUI classes, domestic violence classes, traffic classes, petty larceny classes. Um, we can hold them up here and all of the classrooms are built so they can be 
broken down and made into larger spaces or smaller spaces, so it's a very flexible space. The infrastructure is here to expand and build more courtrooms should that be needed in the future. The city attorney's criminal division will also have space here, offering greater convenience for witnesses and victims who must appear in court. So we've seen the well-thought-out layout of the new building, but another goal was the perfect design. Principal architect Ben Girardin says the idea was to blend traditional with trendy. Architecturally, it's, it's a modern play in a traditional courthouse. Mm -hmm. It's got the um, traditional stairs in the front with the columns, but as you'll see in some of the renderings and you can see in person, uh, the columns are angled very contemporary. It's got metal panels on the outside. There's a lot of glass. Um, so it's, it's a really modern play in a traditional courthouse. Total cost is $56 million, $35 million in general obligation building bonds approved by the city council in 2019. The rest is actually coming from Clark County. The county was adding judges. They were needing more courtrooms. They were looking for space. Uh, so at the time, then, uh, City Finance Director Mark Vincent started talking and doing the calculations on how the county could actually buy us out of the remainder of our lease. We didn't own the Regional Justice Center, we were just tenants on a 99-year lease. Um, so he started working with the county, got the numbers together, and ultimately that deal was finalized by uh, Mr. Hacker and Orlando Sanchez. Um, and the county paid us about half of the purchase price for this building to get us out of the Regional Justice Center. And then we transferred that assessment fee to the remainder of the bonds. So essentially we're paying the same thing for this building that we were for the Regional Justice Center. In the end, there will be more room for Clark County to stretch out in the Regional Justice Center, less confusion for city customers, and in the process, jobs at a time when our community can certainly use them. Current manpower count is approximately 100,000 man hours. Uh, of course, there's many hundreds of hours spent prior to the start of construction that um, that would be added to that. But if you get to the end of our project, we're probably looking at at least 200 to 250,000 man hours uh, just on this project alone. We are so excited. We are beyond excited. It is a beautiful, beautiful building. The courthouse is expected to open in the spring of 2021. And to add to the excitement, at the July 22nd City Council meeting, the council voted to purchase that very last parcel of land on the corner of Maine and Clark. That will enable that to turn into entire campus where city festivals and arts festivals can be held. Well, let's stay on this construction theme a little bit longer. We know that pedestrian bridges are built not only for the convenience of walkers, joggers, and bikers, but also for our safety. So so it's only fitting that the newest pedestrian bridge in Summerlin was named after a young man who lost his life trying to save the life of a pedestrian. For more than a year, this beautiful span across Summerlin Parkway has been under construction, linking the Kellogg's Air Sports Complex to Bonanza Trail and so many walkable neighborhoods. And now this bridge, designed to keep our residents safe in their walking and biking travels, will always be remembered for a young man who lost his life trying to save someone else's. It is dedicated to Alexander Lawrence, who on October 24th of 2011, was headed back to college after visiting family and friends here in Las Vegas. When he swerved to miss someone crossing Summerlin Parkway, he was killed. He was 19. I want to express my sorrow to Alexander Lawrence family parents, Debbie and Scott Lawrence and Taylor, that this bridge was not here in October of 2011 when Alex was killed trying to miss a pedestrian attempting to cross Summerlin Parkway. If it had been here, perhaps Alex would be celebrating his 28th birthday next week with his family. His family, along with many friends, gathered for the official dedication of the plaque bearing his name. Alex was the most caring, loving, and generous person so something like this would seem so out of place, but totally cool. The plaque reads, Alex Ross Lawrence, one heart forever, always together, never apart. The idea to dedicate this plaque came from a family friend who noted Alex's life on that tragic night ended right where the bridge stands. Before I knew it, they started building the bridge. I said, how cool would that be if you know, somebody was able to get this bridge dedicated to Alex to not only um, 
health and the safety of people, you know, pulling over to pay respects. But uh, not only that, for the children that live across the bridge or on this side to get over to the other side. And I watched the, the building process. And as it got closer to the completion, I decided to give Victoria Seaman a call. Um, and she took my call and she said, that is very cool. It's a great story. Um, I'll see what I can do. She said, uh, I can't name the bridge after Alex, but we'll dedicate it to him. So that was plenty enough. So here it stands and will not only serve our community in getting safely across Summerlin Parkway, it will serve as a reminder of a young man, Alex Lawrence, who lost his life trying to avoid taking another. The bridge is 260 feet long, 20 feet wide, and it cost $8.5 million. That money came from federal funds, the City of Las Vegas, and the Regional Transportation Commission. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to tell you how the city is stepping up to help protect the public and businesses trying to comply with the COVID-19 directives. A full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. Ever dream of being in the movies? Why not bring the movies to you? And cut! <laughs> Copy. That was good, we're gonna have to go 10 more times. Become a filming location today. Register your home and or business at nevadafilm.com. If anybody needs me, I'll be in my trailer. I love taking care of my mom. It wasn't easy at first. She learned how to better communicate her needs. And you learned how to not ignore yours. I discovered how to make healthier meals. And I discovered how much I enjoyed them. Becoming a caregiver is a learning experience for everyone. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back to City Beat from Las Vegas City Hall, where my photographer Steve Horlock and I are at least six feet apart. And the only reason I'm not wearing a mask is because we chose an area that is temporarily closed to the public. So let's think about this. If there's a business out there doing everything in its power to comply with the governor's directives to inhibit the spread of coronavirus, like social distancing, cutting down on capacity, requiring people to wear face coverings, and then a business, similar business, say across the street, is not doing any of that. Should both businesses suffer the consequences? Well, the answer actually is no, but it takes a lot of manpower to keep an eye on every single business in the city. So the city of Las Vegas does take the governor's directives very seriously. So we have just put an additional 100 people out on the streets to help with observation and enforcement. They are called compliance ambassadors. Compliance ambassadors work in teams. They start the day with a map of areas of the city where complaints are concentrated concerning businesses that may not be complying with the state's directives to curb the spread of the coronavirus. There are about 100 ambassadors, half work with business license compliance and half work with Parks and Rec, looking at compliance on sports fields. The goal is for the team to visit every business and field in the city. Their job is to help provide a, another layer of compliance by being the eyes and ears of our enforcement teams, 
keeping an eye on businesses to ensure that they are operating the way the directives uh, require them to operate, um, helping assist in our community centers and our parks and rec fields by ensuring that things like youth sports are being conducted in a way that's compliant with the directives and that is providing for um, you know the public's health and safety. The ambassadors may not conduct enforcement actions, but by being out here, they can point enforcement officers to those who are not following the rules. One of the big things that the compliance ambassadors are helping with, because they're out there doing those observations, it's freeing up our actual compliance officers to address those, uh, for lack of a better word, bad apples, the ones who aren't complying with the directive, who are, in some cases, we've actually had a couple who just seem to refuse to comply with the directive. This enables officers to focus on the individual establishments in non-compliance instead of entire industries. Robert Summerfield explains using gyms purely as an example. We don't want an operator who's doing absolutely everything they can do to provide their service, but to provide it in a way that's safe for their customers and safe for our community to be further impacted by this COVID-19 pandemic by being shut down because another gym down the street or elsewhere even in the city is not complying with those rules and not following the directives. Now, the city did not go out and hire 100 new employees. Instead, they trained individuals who already work for the city and who were chosen to participate in the program. They had more than 40 hours of classroom study on what to look for, how to properly communicate with the public on the directives, how to properly document and report to enforcement officers, as well as many hours of ride-along training. Their work frees up the enforcement arm of compliance to issue warnings and fines which, by the way, is sort of a three strikes and you could be out if after several warnings, reinspections, and fines, there is still a refusal to obey the directives? The next step is you will be shut down for two weeks. Okay. Your license will be suspended for two weeks. Um, that is where we're at with this process. And if, God forbid, after that suspension, we have another problem with that business, they will be put on for city council for their license to be revoked. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they're, not only are they shut down, but they may never be allowed to reopen. Summerfield says closing down a business is never the ultimate goal. City leaders know an open economy is a healthy economy. But now with an even stronger contingent out here helping to enforce the governor's coronavirus safety directives, the health of our residents also remains a top priority. Now, this new program not only protects residents, it also protects those businesses that are working very hard every day to comply with the governor's directives. If you see something or experience something you feel is a violation, you can file a report. Just send the complaint to license at lasvegasnevada.gov or you can call 702-229-6281. Recently here on City Beat, we took you to Las Vegas Boulevard between Sahara and Stewart to show you the incredible construction work taking place there to beautify that area, make it more pedestrian friendly, and get the infrastructure up to date. So we wanted to give you a heads up on some road closures coming up so that those beautiful 80-foot decorative arches can be installed. The illuminated arches will provide a striking gateway to downtown Las Vegas near the Strat. Here is what they will look like when in place, but in order to get them up there, there will need to be overnight closures between St. Louis and Stupac Avenues. They are planned for August 10th through the 13th, the 23rd through the 24th, and again, August 26th through the 27th. Each of those nights, Las Vegas Boulevard will be completely closed between 9 p.m and 5 a.m. At all other times, one lane in each direction will remain open in the construction area. Motorists should expect delays. You might consider taking Paradise Road going southbound and Fairfield Avenue for going northbound. We started a little project here on City Beat back in March when we got hit by the coronavirus of photo essays. Some of them featured our unsung heroes, some families trying to find ways to entertain themselves, but it always kind of has a theme. Well, recently they lit up a couple of new signs at Project Anchilada, so we thought this photo essay would highlight our Las Vegas art form, Neon, just in case you need something to smile about.
it's time for another break. And when we come back, we're going to take you to a very solemn ceremony at our Department of Public Safety called the Empty Chair or the Honor Chair. Listen, I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you judge me for having a problem. No one is going to know that I need help. I need help. I know that no one is going to judge me for having a problem. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you listen. Pep Talk Center, we have pep talkers standing by to get you motivated for your GED diploma. Text the name Terry to 69222 for a sympathetic pep talk. You show people what you really are. Or for a gentle pep talk, text the name Deborah. You know you're going to make people very proud of you. And if that's not enough, text the name Danny for an extreme pep talk. Prove everyone wrong, show them you're the boss. Get your GED pep talk and find free GED classes. Text the name of the person you want a pep talk from to 69222. Welcome back to City Beat from Las Vegas City Hall. It was July 19th of 2018 when Corrections Officer Kyle Eng died while on duty at the detention center. Well, recently the Department of Public Safety honored him in a ceremony that's called the Empty Chair or the Honor Chair. It is a remembrance that even though he is no longer in our presence, he will always be with his brothers and sisters. We were there for the ceremony. As we say goodbye, we take you to that very solemn ceremony. Thank you for being here with us today to capture a very special moment in time. Detail. Board. Watch. Detail. Whoa. Center. Face. Present. Watch. Forward. Center, peace. Parade, rest. Today we are here to honor Corrections Officer Brother Kyle Eng. His end of watch will be two years this Sunday, July 19th, 2018. Brother Kyle started with us in January of 2018. He was not with us for very long. However, he touched our hearts and left a special memory that no one can ever replace. He worked for Anderson Dairy for 20 years. Then he applied for the City of Las Vegas Department of Public Safety. And on his application, he stated that he always wanted to be a law enforcement officer. Brother Kyle, you fulfilled that dream. Brother Kyle's family referred to him as Superman as now do we. In February of this year, Saving a Hero's Place came to visit us. This is a nonprofit organization that travels the country to leave something very special with an agency who has lost one of their own in the line of duty. Tommy, Robbie, and Walter joined us in February and explained to us this beautiful chair and what it represents. They explains that it is symbolic of the officer that no longer is physically with us and that they will always have a seat with us. Typically, the seat remains in a roll call room and so everybody will be able to see the seat prior to leaving for the day to service our community. These chairs are all handcrafted individually and are beautifully made. When we unveil the chair, you will be able to see the uniqueness and how it honors Brother Kyle. 
At this time, please take a few seconds of silence with me as we remember Brother Kyle. Thank you. Now we will unveil our chair. Detail, jump, center, face, Brother Kyle, we will continue to carry you in our hearts, and we now have eternally saved your place. Detail. Center. Face. Forward. March. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Saving a Hero's Place. We are eternally grateful for allowing us to be the first recipient of this honor chair in the state of Nevada. Our chair will be displayed in the administrative building at DPS. Please stop by to pay your respects and honor Brother Kyle Lang. <laughs> <laughs>